All right, everybody, welcome to another Friday night episode of Keto Rocks Radio. I'm Jim Hobbs, and somewhere on the screen is my carnivore co-host, Brian Damage Foresight for the band Kicks and Rhino Bucket. And then somewhere on the left or right corner is uh, Brian Meat Tribe Shanker uh, joining <laughs> us this evening. Brian, hello. Hey. Both Brian Tillo. It's always confusing. We have both of you at the same time. So it's the Brian show this evening. So yep. um, it's wel welcome both. Then, thank you. And then today, today's special guest is uh, Dennis, who's been in the meat industry. And uh, we're going to call him the meatologist today. <laughs> Love it. Welcome to the show, Dennis. Thank you very much for having me. Well, Dennis, Absolutely. it's great. A meatologist. We've never had a meatologist, but we need one on this show because truthfully, I think we've just been eating meat blind. So it's great to have someone that can probably answer all the questions we've had uh, throughout the last couple of years. So, so first of all, welcome to the show. And then, and, uh, and can you tell everybody where uh, you reside in and how you became a meatologist? Like, what's your background? How do you, how do you, how do you wake up and go, I'm going to be a meatologist? I, I always I always chuckle a little bit when I see the word uh, described to me as a butcher. So, you know, customers would come up to me and say, are you the butcher? I'd say, wow, that's pretty horrific sounding. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, butchering and meat cutting, it, it is uh, different from one another. So more or less, I just got into industry in 1982 where we just still had some hanging meat from meat hooks and and uh you know of course when companies would buy bigger pieces of meat it, it helped them out on the uh the financial part of it that they paid us to break it down so as time went on it changed to box meat same cuts of meat but they were broken down for us and i more or less uh indulged in learning about the different cuts of meat and how to cook them mostly because I was the cook of the family. But I started in yeah, like 1982 with a company uh, near, very nearby in the Washington area and just retired last year. So, I, you know, I'm still a meat cutter, but I don't get paid as one. Right. So, so 30 yeah. years, so 30 years yeah. you have. Wow. Yes, sir. That's, that's awesome. So if you don't mind, I'm going to bring up a screen just so we can ask intelligent questions and the people who are viewing this uh, can see, you know, can learn something, maybe learn something from you telling us, you know, what meats to look for if we're looking to cook for this reason. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm going to bring that up. You'll still be on the screen, but let me just bring that up for everyone to see. And that's the that's the picture I sent you. Um, earlier. Wow, that looks familiar. <laughs> I, I kiddingly uh, text Brian. I said, uh, is that a picture of a steer he sent me? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I'd give him a, something in his stomach before we got started. <laughs> so like, oh my God. Well, so, so, you know, not being a uh, meteorologist or a uh, when you, when you let me just ask you this question. So does all the uh, the big stores like you no know, Giant, Safeway, Harris Teeter, all those grocery stores, those large chains, have all of them got away from from you know getting that whole meat uh, on a hook and them having a a a, a butcher or, or meteorologist back there cutting up the uh, the different types of meats or Great question. You know, as time changes, things are uh, from the, that industry has been taken over by mass productions. And although Safeway still cuts their own meat, I actually spent the last two years of my career with Safeway uh, because I wasn't really ready to hang my knives up and love the camaraderie in the grocery store with everybody. So I know uh, some of the other stores, maybe uh, Trader Joe's or, but, but a lot have gone to prepack, even the super Walmarts and the super Kmarts. 
And so it brought, really took away from the uh, customer service aspect of things. So at that time, I really indulged in communicating with customers and trying to make them understand, uh, you know, what they were buying and how to cook it and how, their, how to make their meal or dinner a success. Right. Now, this may sound like a stupid question, but I saw someone the other day on a uh, carnivore group thread that they had gone to Walmart and they had purchased a brisket. However, the fat, which was majority of what it was, was mm -hmm. underneath where you couldn't see it. So they had it wrapped so tightly in the package, you saw just the brisket flat. But that was like just the top of the surface, the majority of it was all fat. And these people were irate. They contacted uh, the uh, Walmart and said, hey, listen, I just got home. I opened this up. But this is like unsatisfactory. Um, and I guess they did not get an unsatisfactory, they got an unsatisfactory response. All right. So uh, I, I, I know did. that, I know that question. Uh, I've been asked several uh, times over the years, especially during uh, St. Patty's Day, you know, when everybody's doing the cabbage thing and right. uh, stores will put uh, the bris corned beef briskets on sale. But if you remember, you'll see two parts of that. So what kept Walmart maybe out of trouble with this, the identification on the ticket may have said whole beef brisket, which will include that big hunk of kernel of fat that for whatever reason people buy that but when they put those things on sale there's also called the first cut where they where we take that point of that fatty piece of meat off and we sell it for more as a first cut brisket so the majority of that and you can turn it over to see how and it really is up to the meat cutter and what pride he takes in his craft to, you know, put out a product that meets the identification of it. Like the first cut brisket should have none of that fat that you're talking about. Right. And so there is that confusion. So yeah, I, you know, for the price per pound, it's better just to go with the beef brisket first cut because the whole cut uh, there's so much waste on it, it kind of evens out with the increased price per pound that you would pay for a first cut brisket. Brian, were you aware of first cut brisket? I mean, how that's something that maybe I'm just, I, I'm probably ignorant to that fact, but uh, do they literally label it on the package, uh, Dennis? First cut brisket? They, they certainly should uh, because they're going to increase the price per pound on it. So you'll see that um, pretty close to the barcode that is scanned through the register. Now, and so it is that, important. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask, the, so does the first cut, does that in, include the flat and the point? It's just trimmed down? It, it doesn't include the point of it, which is that okay. fat kernel part of it. That's cut away. And really the identification name saying it's the first cut, it really doesn't say much about uh, the brisket other than it was just the bad part was taken away. So okay. first yes. cut, you know, I, I never really understood. It's just a, a term that's used. And yes. it's, it sounds good, you know, when you're buying stuff like, wow, this is the first cut and mm -hmm. you know it's just a, a a slang term yeah and i see personally i love the point I, that's my favorite part <laughs> then you know how to cook that <laughs> but because most people they would look at that and just be disappointed and say you know what am i going to do with this you know right but, you know a, as we go along with the uh different cuts of meat uh, they certainly have their cooking compliments that goes along with that cut of meat. We'll get into that later because it really makes the difference 
and whether your meal can be a success, especially if you have company over, right? <laughs> yeah. So a question that's always been on my mind, Dennis, and I know you probably have heard this a million times too, but you got different steers, you got different cows, and and when you're you know looking at this chart, you got chuck, rib, plate, loin, sirloin round, flank, brisket. But how how does one determine and where in the process does one determine whether it's prime, choice, uh, what other terms you use to describe the quality of that cut? Who 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 makes that determination? Well, that another excellent question. Um, that goes with the uh, the grading of the beef, and it's not an exact science. So choice would be a grade of beef that's more popular, but if you want to step it up a bit and go for the prime grade, it's going to be, uh, you'll see more marbling, which complements the tenderness, because that marbling will actually melt during the cooking process, which leaves pockets in the meat, and therefore it's going to be more tender. So the grading actually determines when the buyer of the beef goes to the seller and asks them, you know, how long did you feed this steer on grain? So it's really a technique that they've uh, perfected over the years that if, if a, a, a person who raises cattle wants to put out prime beef, they know what to feed them to get that texture in the meat. Choice is a lower grade of, you know, prime. Now, it's USDA prime choice, um, but the choice is a bit lower. But since it's not a, an exact science in being a uh, meat cutter for many years, you know, we run across pieces of meat that could actually make that qualification as, as prime. And that meat comes in with me. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, like I said, it's not an exact science, so you can, you can shop for choice meat and compare and make your own discretion on whether you think, especially as you get into cooking, you know, it's a trial and error thing. Um, and below choice is even a lower grade called, in this area, called select. Mm. And the company I worked for, we used to actually pin these pieces of lower grade beef with these surgical needles so it would actually put pockets in the meat like the the uh, marbling would a uh, piece of prime meat if that makes sense to you so we were kind of giving it a little bit of a chance to uh, be compatible with higher grades of beef so you may even see uh, select choice kind of mixed in you got to look for that terminology uh, but again not an exact science you can look for pieces of beef that you know and when they did grade the beef uh, they would stop the line every once in a while and cut a steer open just to see if it maintained what the first one they looked at was so again it's uh, not an exact science so well, yeah I have I have a friend that uh, uh, owned a steakhouse for a while, and uh, he made a comment on one of my posts, where he, he sent me this link to some kind of apparatus. It had the, the needle thing nice. to tenderize the meat. Yeah. I guess apparently that's what they used in his restaurant to, to make the steaks tender. So was that, was that something he held in his hand? And just yeah. Just kind of in the meat? Okay, so that's a small version. The version that we had was actually a part of a conveyor belt that we would push this meat into. Oh, okay. and it, would, it would disappear uh, because of the surgical needles are very sharp. Um, it, it disappeared in its uh, little cave there for protection, and it would just pound the heck out of this meat. <laughs> uh, and, and the surgical needles would give way anytime it would hit a bone. They, it would just kind of shoot up. So it kind of molded as it was going through the conveyor belt being pinned for this 
lower grade of beef. Um, it, it worked for a while, but it actually took more case life off the piece of meat because anytime you add any kind of friction to a, to a muscle, it's going to start to degrade. So it didn't oh. have the meat case life as other pieces of meat would have. Yeah, it, it was a pretty vigorous thing to put a muscle through, believe it. <laughs> now, yeah. it's, it's my understanding, Dennis, that you can take some of the lower grade meats or even some of the cheaper cut meats. Um, and I, I read an article the other day where a guy buys the cheaper cut of meats and he sous vide them for like 31 hours and he says it breaks them down to the point that just as tender as your uh usd prime choice uh so yeah. have you have you experienced that yeah you know you guys got great questions um that that was one of the fun things i would love to answer for people when they would talk about how in my opinion, what the best way to be cooking, let's say, a chuck roast. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a piece of meat where you want to set it and forget it. You know, I've had customers come back and tell me the chuck roast I gave them was absolutely terrible. And I said, well, I, you know, how did you cook it? How long did you cook it? Oh, I cooked it 45 minutes. <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh, you know. I told him, you know, that you need to just cook that thing. It's it's not going to overcook. I said, literally, you could probably boil a rock long enough you could eat it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you keep adding water. <laughs> I treat my chuck roast like a brisk, mini brisket. I, I do it the same way. From the same area. And uh, sooner or later, I can, you know, go down the uh, different... Uh, sections uh, and, and tell you exactly why uh, you know the brisket would be as compatible to the chuck and not so much the rear end of the animal which is another monster in itself but um, again cooking techniques people have uh, had trial and errors that weren't in their favor sometimes so it, it was nice to clear things up for people awesome well i say let's let's go through that but i do have one more question since you're talking about the you know how the different meats get uh uh classified as usd prime and, and prime choice and select now based on the marbling get that so does your grass-fed beef have a hard time achieving a prime choice rating? I mean, uh, yeah, prime, uh, prime yeah. grade rating because of that? Yeah, nice. Um, it, it does. In fact, uh, uh, just, you know, last uh, holidays, not this past holidays, but the year before, we were uh, bringing in these grass-fed uh, whole tenderloins, which is where you get your filet mignons from, etc. And they really had a weird texture to them. They almost had a texture of the feel of like maybe a fresh liver would feel. It was really very strange to us to, to uh, dive into those cuts where we were so used to the firmness of the muscles that were raised through, you know, steroids, hate to say that, but um, the grains and stuff that would promote growth in the steer. Right. Um, we got real aggressive with feeding a steer in the last few months of its life because it was at that point that they knew that they could add more pounds to the steer. And of course, they would, you know, profit off of that. So the grass fed is, uh, um, again, it, if, if it's it it's really lean, so just like the uh, rear hind quarter of an animal is lean, uh, you just got to treat it that way. Um, some and, and again, some people like rare steaks, <laughs> medium steaks, well done. Yeah. So it it really depends on uh, the cooking technique whether you're going to make that grass fed. Uh, 
worth the money that you paid for it. So, yeah, you know, I've noticed I, I, there's a farm here in Tennessee that I get uh, meat from, and it's grass fed. And uh, I've gotten I've gotten several steaks from them that are kind of on the tough side. And uh, you know, I, and then I go to the Kroger and buy a cheaper steak, and, and it's like so much better. And, I, yeah. and that's probably why, because it's leaner than grass fed. That's that's the exact reason why it's because it's very lean and uh to make it even more clear to you the hind quarter of an animal which is where you get all your round roast and round steaks from it, it and people have to understand that when we talk about meat we're talking about a muscle mm -hmm. and the steer uses that muscle quite a bit you know to get off the ground to carry its heavy self around. So it's that muscle that they use quite a bit that stays lean. So for me to tell you to buy a prime round roast would not be the, you know, the best way to go about treating that terminology that I know this roast is gonna turn out so nice because I brought it, bought it as a prime roast because you're gonna be doing things to that thing that the prime really doesn't have uh, anything that would complement it if you were to cook a chuck roast for 12 hours. You know, prime has nothing to do with it. Like Brian was just saying, you know, the, the grass fed looked great. It was hardly any fat on it. I'm getting my biggest bang for the buck because all I see is, a, is mostly meat here. And then he takes it home and he goes, wow, it's not what I thought. But, you know, he could have taken that hand tenderizer that his, he described his friend owned and helped that steak along the way, or you can marinate it. That helps, you know, marinade breaks down the fibers of the meat, uh, especially if you use anything on the citrus side. Um, let's say if it's like for chicken, and let me say this, if you know how to uh, cook a piece of meat from a steer, you should be fine with any other animal on earth because God made every animal with the same bone structure. And it's incredible. Like when I look at this uh, breakdown of all the roast and steak and the plate and the flanks and stuff, it's literally on every animal, even a chicken, believe it or not. So, if you were to, you know, go on a safari and knock down a zebra, or it, it's the same bone structure, same muscle, tones, everything. Um, so again, it's it's all in the in the technique of your cooking and knowing where the piece of meat came from. And having said that, I'll. I'll go real quick and tell you uh, exactly why and how they broke up this this diagram here. Sure. Because uh, you probably wonder how how far back can they tell a chuck is, you know, without getting into the rib. Like the ribs, like the best piece of meat on a steer, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Me too. <laughs> yeah. So basically, if you were to knock that diagram steer on its back and pull apart his rib cage uh, and again every animal has 13 ribs on each side of the, uh, the uh, spine 13 ribs why I don't know but if you count down five ribs from the head of the animal there five ribs down that's your chuck that's where that's where we would split it so Basically, the next cut of meat would be the rib. So having said that, the chuck eye that's on the later part of that chuck roast is very similar to the rib eye steak. So they call it a chuck eye. Well, many, many years ago, people didn't realize that, you know, buying a really nice chuck eye steak was pretty comparable to the rib eye steak because why? It was right next to it. But they had to split it apart, of course, to get on with their 
their dissection of the animal. So next came the rib. And then after that, the loin. So we got two muscles there that are hardly even used by the feet. You know, the only exercise those pieces of muscle get is if the cow was to take a deep breath. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so again, the chuck gets separated after five ribs. Uh, the rib itself goes for another seven ribs. And then there's one more rib and that's on the loin of beef. And the loin of beef is, is where you get your porterhouse steaks, uh, which comprises of a New York strip at the top and a filet mignon at the bottom. And you don't see the filet unless you have that carcass pulled open by the ribs and you can look all the way down near the uh, rear of the cow and you'll see those tenderloin pieces. And why is tenderloin filet the most popular steak out there? Right. It's because it's so tender. It's really hard to mess up. Yeah. Unless so, you cook it well done. Yeah. Again, <laughs> I always tell people with, you can always put the steak back in or back on the grill. Uh, don't try to uh, guess, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, sometimes, sometimes I would cut a steak to see what it was doing because it's going to be more rare near the bone. And then I would turn the steak over and serve it that way because nobody would see that I checked to see what the steak was doing. <laughs> yeah, that's why I, I always use the reverse sear method just so I know that the steak's already at the right temperature and then I sear it. Yeah. And then that way it's perfectly cooked every time. Yeah, great technique. Yeah, it, it's fun, you know, it's fun to cook and I love trying new recipes. Um, I've made a life change over the past six months and, um, you know, learning how to cook more healthy. And it's, it's uh, you know, having protein is important. So, yeah, especially the you get. Yeah. So it's, it's really helpful to know um, how little or how much to eat. But uh, as, as we move along, um, I can tell you that most of the chuck pieces of meat are very similar in cooking techniques. Like you've heard of your short ribs. Mm -hmm. That comes from the shoulder of the animal. Um, there's uh, the brisket, as Brian mentioned. All cooked very similar. Like... The short ribs, if you go to a restaurant, you know, simmered in juices for 12 hours, you know, they give some kind of identification like this is just going to fall off the bed, and it does. Um, same as a chuck wrist. You know, if you can't cut it with a fork, it hasn't cooked long enough. Now, um, your chuck, wait, out, out of all your different cuts of meats that, are, that come from the chuck portion, would your favorite be the, the chuck eye steak or would you be back back down here to your, your tender medallions or the short ribs? Which, what, what's your favorite cut of meat, Dennis? From the chuck would be, you know, everybody loves what grandma used to make, you know, pot roast with potatoes and carrots and gravies and homemade biscuits. So yeah, that's always a great Sunday. It, it, it'll feed a lot of people cheaper. Um, you can't mess it up, really. You can simmer it, add water to it until the company actually arises, arrives. And it, it's just an all-around good uh, bang for your buck. Um, like I made, excuse me, I made some uh, pork barbecue uh, just a few days ago. And that comes from the shoulder of the pig. Same kind of meat. It's, they don't call it a chuck, but... It is the, uh, a Boston butt laid in, they call it. Um, but again, it, it's a piece of meat that you just want to set it and forget it. Um, that's my favorite to do with the chuck shoulders. Either make a roast to feed everybody and or make barbecue. I wouldn't make barbecue out of the 
at any other place but at the forecourt of the Chuck Shoulders for the barbecue. Uh, remember that because, again, I made reference to that rock. That rock may be able to be eaten after 28 hours, but it's going to be dry and not very flavorful. Right. Uh, chuck roast, they maintain a flavor. They get, and because you know they have fat, and fat is taste. Uh, I've had people. Oh, and by the way, if you were to do a stew beef, and you go to the store and you want to buy it already chunked up into pieces for stew, you have to be very careful because sometimes uh, meat cutters will take a shortcut and use round pieces of meat because it's very lean, very attractive. Mm. But when you get that sucker home, and sooner or later it will break down, but it will be very dry. Um, and, and not very tasty, too. So, Great um, tip. Yeah. It, it is, it's, uh, it's, uh, and you know what? Talk, talking about the uh, hind quarter, and this is the best uh, analogy I can show customers. And I get real excited about this because they're like, you know, why did this turn out this way? And how come there's so many cuts of meat that say the word round on it, like your eye round steaks or your top round steaks or your bottom round steaks. Right. It's, it's that word round that's telling you that it's coming from the leg of the animal. Very uh -huh. lean meat. So... I take them down to the smoked meat case and I show them what's called a center cut ham slice where you have a little piece of bone in the middle. It's about the size of a nickel. And if you look on that ham slice, you'll see all the cuts of meat that I just described. You'll see the eye round steak. You'll see the bottom round steak, the top round steak. And again, that makes up the whole structure of that leg of animal. And it's with every animal. Um, like I said earlier, if you ever go on a safari, you want to take me with you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I have a now. I have a question. Sure. Uh, like I guess these are the, the this chart is just showing like the main kind of meats that you would find at like a in a grocery store or meat counter, but. Uh, I, I noticed these charts never show you like like I love beef cheeks and and all that stuff, but they never include like the the other parts. It's always just the the main body. Right. You talk like the jowls, they call it. Yeah, I love beef cheeks. <laughs> well, you know, I, I it's so funny because I thought about uh, that term before what I logged on because I was thinking about you know again. All the animals are the same. And I used to cut meat with a guy that was from uh, uh, from the east. I think it was Afghanistan or something like that. And they eat a lot of lamb. And, and again, uh, when I used to cut meat, I never was a hunter. My brothers and his friends were. And I was always uh, cutting their deer up for them. And they were like, you know, how long have you been cutting deer? And I said, well, it's not really how long I've been cutting deer. It's I, I just know the bone structure, etc. cetera. Uh, but, you know, eating the, the jowls and even the cheekbone meat off an animal, uh, as described to me by this guy I used to cut meat with, who was from Afghanistan, nothing went to waste. And, he's, and he would tell me, Dennis, the pieces of meat that would come off the the, the head of the animal is like the best and the tender and man it's so good and and at, at the time I was thinking well I'll just stick with the New York strip steak you know, yeah. thank you. but yeah he's he would describe the way they would use different parts of the animal that way uh, if it was cooked correctly right and, just and, like the tail as well yeah or, or check this out <laughs> This guy said they would take the intestines as kids and they would wrap them around these sticks and they would hold them over a campfire. <laughs> I said, what's that called? Cracklins? <laughs> 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 but, 
but uh, again, you know, it, you know, the the Asians they love they can they are the best cooks, you know, and uh, I've learned a lot from them uh, in this trade because uh, you know, like I said, nothing goes to waste. The tripe, which is the cow stomach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even my mother was born in Italy. She was like, oh, I love tripe. Can you get it? I was like, wow, that's something we would throw away. Yeah, that, well, is that what happened? Like, like the head's not included here. So what happens to the head? Uh, again, they, they probably scrape uh, whatever meat. I know we used to still get beef tongue. Uh, and again, that was a tough <laughs> thing too. So that... I was like, hey, hey Dennis, what's Dennis? What's the best way to cook a cow tongue? <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. Uh, I'm thinking they would have to boil that sucker, right? Because it's just so thick, and you know, I asked uh, somebody if they knew even how to cook beef kidney, and they said no. How? I said you boil the piss out of it. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to edit that one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah uh, I, I have a tongue in my freezer that I've been procrastinating because I'm not sure exactly how to deal with it. But yeah. you know, I, you know, I would probably at this point in my life would try anything. You know, as far as oh, me too. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, like I said, there's different ways to complement the meat. You know, I just wouldn't pull it out of the steer and start chawing on it, but like today I'm making beef jerky and it's all from a top round uh, steak. And to describe it a little better, I know most of us have gone to weddings back in the day and you would, or a restaurant, you'd see this piece of meat under a heat lamp and there's a guy with a chef's hat on and white coat, he's carving pieces of raw, almost raw meat on the people's plates, and that is a round, a steamship round, they would call it. It wasn't the full leg, because the full leg is kind of big to get through. So it usually would be half of it, like mostly the top round part of it. Uh, and again, it has to be served you know, in, in a rarer state than well done, because the more it cooks, the tougher it's gonna be. And round steak, what we would do at, at our uh, in our meat room, we would use that to make cube steaks, and it would, a cube steak machine would tenderize it. You'd see cube steaks out in the case that had these really nice deep uh, square cuts in them. Mm -hmm. you, if you spread out the piece of meat, you could probably you know see right through it. That kind of tenderizing. Um, that was the best way for me. And, and on a side note, my, my father actually had 45 years in the meat industry and he had six kids when I was growing up. So in order to give us all of a steak, he would buy round roasts and he would run them through these cube steak machine and we all ate steak, right? Um, and my mom would flour it and salt and pepper it and we'd have, you know, our Worcestershire sauce. And but it wasn't until I got into the meat room where I was like, you know, what is a T-bone steak? We, we really didn't eat that kind of that meat back then. The steak, and it wasn't affordable. Um, but again, the, uh, the real hey, my first, hey, hey, Dennis, this, this is, this yeah. is true confession here. My first experience with steak, this is going was a Swanson TV dinner for <laughs> Salisbury steak. So, Salisbury steak right Salisbury steak so i could come any more uh primitive than uh than than or or, or uh lower uh, cut of, of of meat than than my first experience of steak was Salisbury steak from a swanson tv dinner well, tray. if you want if you ever want to step back in time you take yourself a piece of cube steak from the store uh and you saute it in well i would dip it in flour that I would put black pepper in and salt. I'd flour it, put it on top of a skillet, and I'd let it simmer and cook and 
I even would use it for even a steak sandwich, it would be so tender. But if you keep it in there with the onions long enough, the onions start to caramelize and they start making a nice crust on the meat. And that's the best way to duplicate a Salisbury steak because usually in those TV dinners, those are chopped and formed into that patty mm -hmm. and they season the meat. So they call it a Salisbury steak. Yeah, the only thing I remember as a kid was, I just remember it was almost like eating a box of Cracker Jacks. You were always going to find some type of gristle or something when you were eating yeah. it and, go, and be grossed <laughs> out by it. Like, what the heck was that? <laughs> Especially if you got a, a space between your teeth. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I did have that. Still have that. <laughs> so uh, I've covered, you know, what to do with a chuck you know, shoulder. I hope I made that clear that it's really a hard piece of meat to mess up uh, if you if you cook it long enough. You certainly can't take it off uh, the heat too early because it's just not going to do any good at all. Right. And you would you want you would want a chuck roast for yourself if you were going to make uh, a pot of stew beef, you know, beef stew. Uh, cut it from the chuck. Don't use the rim. You'll be disappointed. Uh, the rib complements itself. Again, it, it's a steak. It's a muscle that the steer hardly uses. So it's got plenty of fat on it for that taste. It's very tender. Uh, as you go down, the loin of beef has the, uh, and the loin is you know, all over the United States, people have different descriptions of cuts. Um, right here where it says loin, people would call that back straps. Um, if you can compare that real quick to a pork chop, where if you saw a pork loin chop, it has the pork tenderloin at the bottom and the loin at the top. Well, that looks just like a T-bone steak, right. quarterhouse steak. Right. And you, you can apply that to lamb, like lamb loin chops or lamb rib chops. Um, same muscle, um, same cooking techniques for that area of the uh, animal. And as you scoot down the animal, it does get a little tougher and leaner. Sirloins are, you know, gosh, again, it's, it's your own discretion uh, in whether you like a piece of rare meat or well done. Sirloins, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know, you can just got to pick and choose. It's, it's, it's not the steak that people really think it is when you say sirloin because, you know, a lot of times you see, uh, ground beef they may say it's ground sirloin right and back to uh brian's question about what do they do with the uh the head of the the steer i'm sorry if i didn't answer that um they would literally would scrape all the meat and use it for hamburger you know in these plants you know any, anything to not let anything go to waste it might be tedious work but you know you, there's a thousand things to do with hamburger, right? Right. Yeah, Dennis, talking about that, I mean, you started out in 1982, but were the organs shipped to to the uh, to the meat department back then, or is that something that's already been put away and it is shipped separately than from the from the cow that's hanging from a beef hook? Yeah, that that would be all cleaned up. We would just get the carcass. We wouldn't have to. And that's where, that's where the term butchering comes in. Uh, the butchers would, would butcher the meat. You know, they would open up the carcass, clean it all out, cut it into the, the sections that, they, uh, that I described to you. And they just, uh, I don't know, it, it, it's changed over the years, so. Um, well, let me ask you another question before I forget this one. This is what's important. I don't know how it is in, in Maryland or Tennessee or other parts of the country, 
but I can tell you the last this last week I've gone to to Walmart, uh, Aldi's, uh, Harris Teeter, Giant, and I can tell you uh, at least the Walmart and Aldi's their whole meat counters totally empty. I mean there may be one or two packages of something, but literally just empty. I keep hearing about the the, the chicken shortage and 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 having problems getting beef in. Um, like I could even find uh, turkey meat last night. I had to, believe it or not, I had to go to uh, Target, which I never think about going to, to, right. to purchase meat, uh, to find it. Um, so do you have any uh, theories or idea, like why are we having such a meat shortage when I thought most of the meat's grown around, especially in this area, Virginia, Tennessee, and Maryland, we have plenty of farms and yeah. Brian, you got uh, a question? I, I, no, I, w- I was going to actually respond to what you're saying. I, I was just watching a video this morning. I don't know if you saw it. Dr. Barry posted that. Well, I'm in his Patreon group. So right. it's, uh, there's no meat shortage. It's the, um, the processing plant. There's only like four major processors, and they – it's almost like the oil industry. They, they control the output. It's just so they can jack the prices up. It's like this whole monopoly on, on the meat market. But it's a very interesting video. I, I'll have to send you the link. To it. Maybe you can put it in the no, show notes or something. Sure, sure. Yeah, again, I, I'm shocked too. I, I walked into a food lion a few nights ago. Uh, I make my own dog food. Uh, from scratch yeah got yeah i got my i do that with my cat (laughs) yeah yeah, it's i've been doing it for gosh maybe six seven years now and my wife used to buy these frozen bricks that she had flown in and i asked her one day how much are we paying for a delivery because that was like twice a month and she goes you don't want to (laughs) know so uh, so now i gotta know and then (laughs) so i said cut the next shipment off i'm making our dog food from now on so it's 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 quite a task but it's rewarding uh, to hear your vet saying i don't know what you're doing but keep doing it but uh well yeah, Dennis, was, Dennis, that's what go ahead no i was gonna say that's that's that was my uh my frantic shopping from going from store to store yesterday because today's our day to cook for our, our basset hound and we cook we cook we cook his food every week and package it for 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 the next seven days but he eats ground yeah. turkey and i could not find ground turkey anywhere that's except for target was, that's what i was after was a three pound tub of yep ground turkey and that's what i was looking for yep you know it's it's lean it's it's great for the dogs uh you know my wife says why don't we mix it up a little bit and maybe get some beef in there and I, i'm like well you know Beef is number one. It's much more expensive than than ground turkey, and it's ground turkey is healthy. So yeah, I'm I'm shocked. Um, I talk still talk to people in the industry, and it's it's a uh, hit or miss. You know, you just don't know. Like in my last, uh, you know, I retired over the uh, middle of the the pandemic, and everything was hit or miss. They said, well, just keep ordering until you see it come in. Keep ordering, because I was a meat manager for many years. So being on that front line of things, the supply and demand was something that I saw on a daily basis. And of course, these questions would always come up, you know, what's going on, you know? And I I heard uh, it was part of what uh, Brian was saying earlier. And also, you know, people have really stopped working. Uh, you know, uh, they've taken their liberty to sit this one out, if if that makes sense. So, the the uh, the workers that process these meats, uh, they're getting it done, but not fast enough. And when when that happens, and you're behind in your quota or your projection that you want to hit for next month then you know it's it's hard to keep up uh, especially you know when you're 
and there's not many plants like Brian was saying, especially when you're trying to feed the whole country, you know? So they, they kind of diversify, you know, between stores and they would send uh, products to the busier stores, right? That makes sense, right? They make the, the most money and I would actually have to call other stores to see if I could get a product for a customer or just wondering, you know, are you getting ground turkey in? Because I haven't seen it for a week. Right. So it, it is a very strange uh, industry out there. I, I can't, for the life of me, like Ryan was saying, you know, why, why can't, you know, why can't we go into a store and just have the same selection? Because, you know, in, in the steer around here, mostly you would find uh, dairy farms. And, and, of course, cow is different than a steer. Right. Um, but I do see, you know, the organic uh, popping up, which is great to see. There's some uh, people out this way in Frederick that have uh, gone to that area of expertise. Because, uh, you know, you really have to have an expertise in it because I, I think I heard it takes quite a few years. To five, get, year, five, years five years to get your organic to get designation. The Yep. Yeah, I heard it was between five and seven. Yeah, I knew it was somewhere in there. Uh, I have a neighbor friend of mine that I used to hunt over. She had a 1,300 acre dairy farm and things just got weird and she had to stop that milking the cows and went into raising black Angus. Um, so again, it's, it's an ever changing industry. Uh, just catering to maybe some people who, you know, need that step saver, so to speak, you know, that, that they don't want to take a piece of big meat home. They would rather have it already sitting in the meat case marinated or something that would just cut their time in half so they wouldn't have to prepare it. And, but, and again, some people love cooking. Yeah. I don't, I don't mind standing in front, you know, and of course, the reward always comes when, wow, I remember Rob Galpin came over one time and made some hamburgers, and he just couldn't help himself. He got into those burgers before anybody else does. He's like, man, these are the best burgers I ever had. <laughs> I, I remember we, we were recording one time over in uh, Clarksburg many years ago, and I just ate a bunch of beef jerky, and I burped. He goes, man, that smelled good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, I always think of that. I said most people would be like, "Oh man, what'd you do that for?" <laughs> That's why. Like, uh, like, you wait for me to burp again. <laughs> I, I have a question. Uh, uh, how would somebody go about finding a reliable, well, butcher or or meat cutter? Um, because I've been sort of wanting to find that, you know, I, I do, I shop at the Kroger up here by my house, but I know there's several around me. I mean, out here in Tennessee, there's a lot of different areas and, you know, I go online looking for, for different butcher shops and stuff. And, and there are a few down like near Nashville, down, you know, right outside of town, but they're all like these high end kind of, you know, they just seem super expensive and, and you would think it would, it would be, I don't know if it'd be cheaper to go to a butcher, but how do you, how would you, how would somebody go to like, figure out which one to go to? Uh, well, again, that's uh, an ever changing industry where, it, and I'm trying to picture what you're describing. If, if you are walking into a butcher shop, and you're seeing these cuts of meat that aren't much more, if not more expensive than what you could get at a store. And that's, that's what they're after. They're after, I'm gonna wow these people, make this case look like you can't find this piece of meat anywhere else but here. Mm -hmm. And you know, displaying it nicely is, is, is great to see when a customer walks in and having the interaction between uh, the meat cutter and yourself. I always used to tell people, the customers that I 
they were like, oh, thank you, Dennis. That that steak we had last night was great. And I said, well, just keep in mind, it's always it's always the best thing to have a relationship with your neighborhood butcher, you know. Yeah. Guy, you know, because I I know that a piece of meat is the most important part of the meal. Everybody has it, whether it's a piece of fish or uh, sometimes it's the only part of the meal. Yes. Yeah. So you want to at least have that right. You know, you you could overcook rice. That's not a too much of a drag you could boil some more water right but the, the piece of meat at the table is like the crown jewel right so you just want to make sure that so you know back to that butcher shop you know i have one nearby me you know it's in mount airy maryland and uh same thing you walk in you see the meat cutters you you you, you hear the commotion you smell it and you're you're just caught up into the wow of, wow, you know, I can't go to the giant and smell this, you know, that kind of thing. So it's really uh, caters to the area too, as well. I mean, I wouldn't be sticking a lot of cheap meat out there because people don't like to cook. So if people are coming off the street into this butcher shop, then you're going to probably want to stick out your most expensive wow meats out there. So they, they're, they'll come back and just go, man, that was the best steak. So yeah, so all those little things may play into part why that piece of meat may be just as expensive, if not more, than a regular grocery store. Yeah, well, some of those 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 butcher shops, they're they're in a trendy area. So, you know. See, that's, yeah. that's what I mean. It, it really depends. Yeah. And, you so know, in I should probably find one that's further out somewhere, you know, out in the country somewhere. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of great resources. Um, I, you know, I, I always tell people, you know, whether you'd want to barter with them. Like I used to cut my brother's deer up for a case of beer, right? But I never hunted. And then one day I stepped out in the woods and I never came out. <laughs> But uh, it, it's it, and that's a hit or miss thing too. It, it's nice to be able to have that go to <laughs> butcher shop, and that's all they perfect in is you know that production of the main course, you know. But um, well, really, talking yeah. talk, talking yeah. about price, talking about prices. Let's let's uh let's bring on Brian Shanker in this segment from the Meat Tribe yeah. to give us those meat deals of the week because. Hey, Brian, kudos to you because last week I went out there. I think I shared it, uh, saved $120 on ribeyes uh, from Harris Teeter. Um, and then I also saved, uh, bought ground beef, 80-20 for two seventy seven dollars a pound at, at Giant. So, yeah, I missed, I missed that Giant deal on the ground beef. I didn't even see that <clears throat> until you sent it to me. So thank you for that. No problem. So what do you got for us this week? All right. So Carms at a central PA, their deals run through the 31st. Uh, they've got some choice grade boneless New York strip steaks for $9.99 a pound. And also some um, chuck roasts, choice grade boneless, obviously chuck roasts for $5.99 a pound. <clears throat> uh, Food Lion's got a couple of deals that are pretty good. Their deal runs through the 1st of February. They've got choice grade boneless New York strips also for $9.99 a pound. And they've got a choice grade shoulder roast for $5.99 a pound. And <clears throat> Harris Teeter switching it up. Their deals run through the 1st of February. They've got some rancher grade, which is like select, USDA select. Um, they've got their bone in porterhouse and T-bone steaks. The value pack is $6.99. The small pack is $7.49. And if you want them in uh, USDA choice grade, you're going to pay $7.99 for those. And then Kroger's got a couple of deals running through the 1st of February. Uh, they've got some choice grade boneless ribeye family pack steaks for $12.99 and choice grade uh, chuck roast for $5.99. So I almost kept everything under $10 per pound again with exception to the uh, ribeyes at Kroger's. But since we have Dennis here, I, one of the things I was going to ask him is last week, Kroger 
had a choice grade boneless half strip loin on sale. And I don't know where the strip loin comes from. Can you tell us from that chart that? Sure. That it's, where right, that's it's right in the middle there where it says loin. Okay. And that, that piece of meat you just described is, again, the top part of a pork chop or a top part of a lamb loin chop. The New York strip is the top part of the porterhouse. So, um, okay. What the, was throwing the, me off? The, what was throwing the, me off was the word loin being added yeah, to it. <clears throat> right, and those those strip loins that, and you would see hat. We, we would we would display them in in halves, and they would usually promote them during the holidays. You know, as a roast, and I'm thinking, well, who in the world would want to roast a New York strip, right? So, it, it's kind of misleading in a way. You know, I would buy. A, a New York strip roast, as they described it, and I would just take it home and cut it into steaks. Um, so again, you know, when you roast something that is that dense, obviously the end pieces are going to be well done, where the center part is going to be pretty rare. So that that's a piece of meat that I would not roast at, as described. In the description, okay. and there, there, there are two sides to that. There's uh, the strip loin can be as long as like 18 inches long, and when you cut that loin in half, there's going to be a sirloin end, and then the other end is going to butt up against the rib end, just like the chuck eye steak butts up against that rib. So if you can get that side of the New York strip that butts up against the rib you'll see that that one steak sometimes looks very familiar like why does that look familiar well it almost looks like the rib eye steak because that's where they had to break the animal yeah that makes sense yeah all right is that uh is that all the uh deals we got for this week there mr shanker yes sir that's it that's all i'm giving you for now well let me ask you one question for you uh conclude your part you were going to buy some of that chuck eye or round eye and 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 did you ever do that and experiment with it uh, so i've bought chuck eye steaks plenty of times before um but i did not get out to the sales last week and and i was like time got away from me and i went back and i was like oh man i missed the ribeye sale at harris teeter hopefully they have ribeyes on sale again this weekend i missed out they, they got the porterhouse and T-bones on sale this week. So I'm hoping the ribeyes come back next week because I'm, I'm low. I'm low. I've, got, I've got three ribeye steaks in the freezer. They're prime grade. And my wife is like, why are you not cooking me those steaks? Said, I'm telling her because I only have three. We only got three left. <laughs> I'm holding on to them until I can replace them. Yeah, that's gold. Yeah. With the chuck eye steaks, you don't find very many out in the meat case because there's there's only going to be that one steak uh, that comes off that's closest to the rib. So when we would cut chuck roast, of course we would use that term. We would steal the chuck eye off the first roast because it looks so much like a rib steak, rib eye steak, and we'd sell it as a chuck eye steak. So you'd only see like one every once in a while maybe two in a pack. If a customer rang the service bell and said, could I get, you know, 18 chuck eye steaks, it ain't going to happen because we would have to open up 18 bags of meat to pull those one steaks out of each one. And of course, as soon as you open up that, that meat, the, the time starts ticking because those are cry back pieces of meat that the air gets sucked out of and and so they're kind of preserved in that cryback package until needed and those, those cryback packages gosh we've had pieces of meat in our cooler that you know would go two months in this cryback packaging because all that air would be sucked out of it um well that's a good question right there you just you just triggered yeah. a good question dennis so when you see that 
meat's been been aged for for six months 12 months 12 days we what's real quickly just you know what's the advantage of having it uh dry or or hang for 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 let's just say 12 12 days 12 weeks whatever the whatever it should be what's what's the advantages it it, it has to uh you know, obviously they they cut all that away to get to the heart of the the piece of meat that's going to be complemented from the aging technique mm -hmm. and when you age a piece of beef it's really the breakdown of the fibers that the blood is doing to the meat so when it's hanging and drying on the inside all that moisture from the blood stays intact with the muscle and it starts to break it down very slowly not so it would be mush or anything like that but that's how that complements aged beef you know you go to a restaurant i've seen descriptions new york strip steaks aged to perfection well how long does that mean what do you mean by age so i've gone into grocery stores and i've seen the back cooler where they got these you know specific usually it's loins of beef where you get your porterhouse steaks from is what I mostly see and that would be most complemented by dry, the drying of the beef and letting the the, uh, the molecular structure of, in the components of the blood to tenderize and, f and flavorize this meat also. Um, one of the funniest things when we used to grind hamburger in the morning in these big huge tubs that would actually grind like 200 pounds of meat. If you were to lift the hopper up, the lid to that and smell it, you would smell that, that gas that was in, in the blood and it would actually smell good. <laughs> I had an old German guy when I was apprentice, he, he caught me smelling the meat. <laughs> he said, he said, he said, that smells pretty good. No, no. I said, yeah, it that does. That's now, do you ever taste it? Do you ever taste it when you're in that process? I, like the tartar? Yes. Yeah, I have. <laughs> no, it's, it's delicious. Not without, not without a little salt. I was a salt fiend back then, but, but yeah, people would uh, actually, you know, give me a piece of meat and say, could you grind this for me? And I said, sure, just out of curiosity, you know, what are you doing with it? Well, I'm going to eat it, you know, this tartar. I said, okay, here you go. Ta-ta. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, I just looked up and saw what time it is. So I'm going to go around everybody. If anybody else has any questions for Dennis and Dennis, thank you. We're definitely going to have to have you back on at another time because this has definitely been intriguing for me. I don't know about everybody else, but I'm thoroughly oh, yeah. going to talk about this all day. Yeah, we could we could do a segment on cooking those pieces of meat. Uh, yeah, we'll to do that. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Let's let's plan on doing that. We'll we'll do cooking with Dennis okay. and uh, we'll go over your different cooking recipes. But does anybody else have any questions for Dennis? Uh, I've got a million, but I'll have to save that for another. Okay. You, Brian can share my uh, email. You can shoot me an email anytime. Okay, we will do that. Well, one of the things that we always do, uh, if you've made it to this part of the show, is Brian gives you a bit of advice to uh, help you on your way of uh, boosting your immune system and making yourself as healthy as you can. So, Brian, what bit of advice would that be? Awesome. I would say eat your meat. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I would second that. And so thanks for everybody for tuning in. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, you've been a pleasure uh, and an honor to have you on the show. Thank you, Brian Shanker. And we'll see everybody else next Friday. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well, and stay out of that hospital. Okay, Jim. Thank you. We'll see you, everybody. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye.